All right, Kwang, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon to my presentation on the philosophical, historical, and cultural interpretation of an old Chinese classical text called the Chun Chu. So let's start with the simplest things. Chun Chu are two Chinese characters who simply means uh, spring and autumn. And spring and autumn is a way to say time in ancient China, or more specifically, a historical record of the principalities of the uh, warring state era and of the spring and autumn era, because that book of the Lu principality, which was the principality in which Confucius was born in 551 BCE, uh, gave the name to the era. So, uh, why do I want to talk about that book first? The original document was a historical chronicle kept by the Lu state covering year 722 BCE to 481 BCE. Okay, so it's spanning about 250 years. The original document per se is something quite drab and quite boring to read because sometimes you only have one word for a year, for a given year, for example, locus, because that year there were plenty of locus, or you have uh, short sentences of 10, 12, 47 Chinese characters at the most. So according to tradition, Confucius, because he was an official in the Lu Principality, had access to that state document. And he edited that document in the sense that he would choose careful wording to express a philosophical meaning. Okay. And uh, the ex expression in Chinese for that is Wei Yan Ta Yi, meaning sublime words for great ideas. But it's not the true piece of literature on which I want to discuss today. What I truly want to discuss today are the three philosophical and political interpretations of that Lu Chronicle having epistemological and political consequences. What do I mean by epistemological? Epistemological for me is the journey of the development of the mind. According to a traditional map of mind development, mind has six layers. And those layers can be simply labeled or categorized as one, two, three, and four, five, six. There is a parallel that we can make with the Platonic map and the Confucian map. Uh, I wouldn't use English words first and I don't want to complicate things because uh, if you want the Greek or the Chinese words after one, afterwards, I, we can discuss it. Since we are speaking in the Chinese control group, I want to say that you can find that metaphor for the mind development in paragraph 2.6 of the Analex, and we can go back to that later on. So, the six layers of mind, if I use simply English words for that, one is this, the sense of perceptions, or I would call it vitality. Two is the intellect. Now, the, inter the intellect meaning the wording, the conceptual, and the imaging machines. And three is the psyche. What is a psyche? The psyche is the inchoate soul. And that is what would be called the animal kingdom. For Confucius, it corresponds to the symbolic ages of 15, 30, and 40, as I said in paragraph 2.6 of the Analex. The other part, which is more the timeless dimension of the divine kingdom, is four, five, six. Four is the soul, five is the inner cosmos, and six is the self. Why I'm speaking of that? Because the three philosophical interpretation of the Chun Chu would be related to that. And those three interpretation names, no Gu Liang, Gong Yang, and uh, Zuo Zhuan. 
would offer very different images of Confucius. And the interpretation that I want to put forward this afternoon is the Kong Yang Zhuang. And since it's the main interpretation that I want to discuss at large, even if I will say some words about the other three, two, I will spell the how it's written in well in alphabet the Kong Yang Zhuang. Kong is G-O-N-G-Y-A-N-G. -G -G, and for those who know a little bit of Chinese, the G in alphabet translate transliteration is pronounced like a K, like in kangaroo. So it's Kong Yang, Zhuang, Z-H-U-A-N. And Zhuang can be translated as transmission, tradition, interpretation. So when we speak of the Kong Yang Zhuang, understand the interpretation from Kong Yang. And according to tradition, that Kong Yang Zhuang has been given by one famous direct disciple of Confucius, and that direct disciple is Zhu Xia. Zhu Xia is his aristocratic name, okay, because Zhu means master. So it denotes that Zhu Xia belongs to the gentry or the aristocracy. His name is Pu Shan. Pu is his family name, B U, and his given name is Shang, S H A N G. And as you notice, I always give the names in the Chinese order, meaning the family name first and the given name second. So that Zhu Xia uh, lived a very long life since he was born in, four, in 507 BCE and he died in 400 BCE, meaning he lived to 107 years old. Uh, now we have to understand that in the Kong Yang Chuang, is perceiving the Chun Chu not merely as a historical chronicle, but as the magnum opus of Confucius, okay? The major work of Confucius. And according to tradition, Confucius himself said that I wouldn't be remembered because of the Chun Chu. And that magnus opus by Confucius was offering his ideas regarding social political order Unlike the Zuo Chuan, which is the other one, Z-U-O, according to a guy named Zuo, his family name, a later favorite among many scholars for its vivid narrative of historical events. And we are speaking of the Zuo Chuan about the vivid narrative of historical events. The Kong Yang Chuan, the main interpretation that I want to offer, was compiled in a dialogistic style resembling a class conversation between a Confucian scholar and his student, this student, sorry, discussing the profound meanings behind the subtle words of Chun Chu, Wei Yan, okay, or sublime words or subtle words of Chun Chu and was brief in explaining the historical context because of its emphasis on theoretical interpretation of the annals, okay, because the Chun Chu is a historical chronicle or annals, it is the political theory wing of Confucianism. The primary assumption of Kong Yang Chuang is that Confucius authored the Chun Chu, not the basic boring text, which was simply a historical chronicle, but the uh, philosophical interpretation so Confucius authored the Chun Chu in order to criticize the politics of his time and set a constitutional guideline for future generations. Moreover, Confucius is not merely a transmitter of ancient scholarship as seen in the Analects, for example, but a charismatic sage, okay? And a charismatic sage in the Chinese word for it is called a sheng, who should have received the mandate of heaven and become a king himself. And here we have a parallel with the philosopher king coming from the Platonic interpretation. But since Confucius did not receive the kingship due to political circumstances at the time, he combined the Chun Chu based on official chronicles, Shut the, up. Chronicle, the chronicle of his own Lu principality, in which he criticized the events and the historical figures of the spring and autumn period according to a coherent philosophy. 
So, so based, on, follow. based on this assumption, Gong Yang Chuang strives to undercover what is claimed to be a deeper meaning behind layers of subtle text. So here we, ha we then understand that it's not only uh, a teacher of rituals that is perceived usually uh, most of the time in some other texts, especially in the Zhuo Chuang. In that, uh, how else can I say it? The Kung Yang Chuang propose three stages of human history. Uh, the Kung Yang Chuang proposed that human society evolves over time and could be divided into three phases. The, th the first phase is marked by political chaos and social anomaly. The second stage is characterized by the re-establishment of legitimate political order. And the third stage, called in Chinese, Taiping Shu, is when the world as a whole experiences great harmony and that every individual is able to fulfill or realize their potential. So Taiping Shu can be truly translated as the world of great harmony, okay? Because uh, in Chinese, there are three words who, uh, which often are mixed. An means safety. It doesn't mean peace because most of the time I hear people translate An as peace, but An is not peace, An is safety and Ping is peace, but the highest possible peace. And He is harmony. So, uh, so those three words are often mixed. So what I do, do they mean, or what do the uh, Kong Yang Chuang interpretation means by the Taiping Shu or the word of uh, supreme uh, peace? First, you have a unity of cosmological and political order. Okay, what, what do they mean by that strange or a little bit abstruse phrase of unity of cosmological and political order? It means that there is a perfect match between uh, the epistemological development and the social status of a given person, okay? So in other words, you have a perfect match in the epistemological stature of someone and his so social status. That is the unity of cosmological and political order. Because once again, I repeat one, two, three, in terms of epistemological development is the vitality of the senses perception, the intellect and the psyche, and four, five, six are the higher order of the timeless form of beauty, truth, and goodness. And in Chinese uh, uh, political understanding, you have the hexagram, which represents that perfect matching between the epistemological uh, development, the lower trigram one, two, three, what I just said, vitality, intellect, psyche, and the upper trigram four, five, six, corresponding to the timeless form of truth, of beauty, goodness, and truth in order four, five, six, and at the same time, if we are in a typing shoe, which is the ultimate end goal of universal history, you have the exact matching between the epistemological stature, which I gave the six words for that, and your, your social status, okay? So the number one correspond to the commoner, the number two correspond to the petty officer, the number three to the officer, the number four to the lords and ministers, number five to the sovereign, and number six to the sage. Of course, no society on earth till now accomplished that perfect matching between epistemological stature and social status, okay? It's a theoret theoretical and philosophical word of, uh, uh, of axio epistemopolitical uh, understanding. The other, other characteristic of a typing shoe of the great harmony, if you want, is the reconciliation between past and present sources of political legitimacy. Uh, since China always had an understanding of political form as only the monarchy, at least at the time, 
It means also the limitation of monarchical power, also the distinction between legitimate political maneuver and the real politic, okay? Because in the Kongyang Chuang, it's much more idealistic than the Zuo Chuang, for example, which, which would be more the real politic wing of the Chun Chu interpretation. Because if you read the Zuo Chuan, uh, you will have a description of battles, of intrigues at court, of uh, marriages between uh, noble houses, of uh, assassination attempts, of uh, alliances between uh, principalities, of uh, debates between uh, ministers at one co uh, royal court or uh, at different royal courts. So the kind of stuff that we would uh, encounter by reading uh, real politic uh, books, uh, for example, uh, even nowadays. Uh, if you read uh, the book by Henry Kissinger on China, for example, well, it's full of real politic. If you want a uh, practical uh, example. And I keep on with the what is called the Taiping Shu in the Kongyang Chuang is the right interaction between human and heaven. And here we have to understand that the right interaction between human and heaven is precisely the harmony of the hexagram. Okay, once again, I repeat that the hexagram is a cycle cosmogram. So it can be understood on the one side as an epistemological diagram. Okay, once again, I, I think it's the third time I repeat that, but it's truly the core of my presentation. One, two, three, the vitality, the intellect, the psyche, that is the animal mind. Four, five, six, the, the timeless forms of beauty, goodness, and truth, and that is the timeless mind or the divine mind. And the interaction between human and heaven, you have to understand that heaven is formed by the lines four, five, six, and human in the sign, in the meaning of animal human, human animal, if you want, is one, two, three, but the true human would be the animal, hum the human animal who was capable to receive the timeless form at four, five, six of beauty, goodness, and truth, because that is the core essential of a typing shoe, okay, because if you want to have a typing shoe, it means that the people inhabiting that great harmony world have a true epistemological development, meaning they are truly humans and not only human animals. And the distinction uh, in that book uh, of the Kong Yang Chuan, that philosophical and uh, epistemological interpretation, uh, there's also something that resembles more or to Rayan politics, meaning that they distinguish between Chinese and non-Chinese culture and what they call just retribution, but I would call that justice because uh, uh, the level of the justice is at the timeless uh, form of beauty. Uh, so uh, it is absolutely normal that uh, justice would be present in the Taiping Shu or the uh, world of great harmony. I, I propose, uh, of course I have other things to talk, but I propose that we, I have, a short period of question and answer now after about 10, 15 minutes of talking. Do you have any question? If not, I will keep on because I have other things to talk, of course. I see that Jason wanted to say something. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, uh, when you talk about one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, so are you talking about the hexagram on the Yi Jing or? So you talk about so you count from the button as one two three four five six and Absolutely. then, uh, I'm, so I'm, no my I'm question is right. yeah my question is uh you talk about that's a different kind of interpretation for what for everything or uh, okay and, and the second question is uh, I will uh, like to know because that's my first time heard about this. So I would like to know why you said it is based on uh, your understanding or based on uh, any classic uh, tradition. Yes, absolutely. It's based on, it's based on the, the Yi Ching and the Wang Pi interpretation of the Yi Ching. Okay, so let's not forget that the, the Yi Ching, 
you have uh, the and very important annex which is called the shengi in chinese uh, okay i would wait uh, jason uh, jason oh yeah uh, yeah I, I got it so basically you are talking about this uh uh different kind of interpretation is one piece interpretation uh, more than one piece Wang Pi as the successor to the Ten Wings interpretation. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's a uh, it's a been described in Ten Wings. Exactly. And Wang okay. Pi, and I would like to uh, to to mention to everyone that Wang Pi uh, had a very short life, just twenty three years. He was born in two forty six, and he died in uh, four, 23 years later, uh, two forty nine, and he died twenty years later. Oh, I'm sorry. He died in 249 and he was born in 226. Okay, born in 226 and he died in 249, uh, 23 years later. So, in that very short life, uh, he managed to give the most outstanding interpretation, or I would say refinement of the interpretation, which was already present in the 10 winds explanation of the original Yi Ching, okay? So Wang Pi gave some refinement on that and that interpretation stayed the major epistemological understanding of imperial China, meaning that we have a achievement or a journey of mind development as symbolized by the hexagram, the lower hexagram being the human animal mind once again vitality intellect and psyche and but that human anim, animal if he wants to uh, evolve would have to learn to meditate and to uh, improve uh, its understanding of reality so in order to receive the higher uh, timeless uh, forms of beauty goodness and truth which are the line of heaven okay uh, four five six okay the the, the the animal dimension and the heavenly dimension and i, I thank you uh you, i thank you uh jason for asking that question but even for chinese like you it might be not clear so i imagine that for the other people it might not be clear so thanks for your question yeah, I, I probably have some bias. That's the big difference between me and the Quan because I don't like Wang Bi much. Okay, so that's one of my bias. I have to admit. Okay, and the second thing, I don't connect Yi Jing with uh, Confucius much. Okay, so yeah. that that's you can say that's uh, our difference, and I totally yeah. respect. Uh, his difference and my difference. I'm not saying I'm right, he's wrong, but I don't admit I was wrong. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you for the, that's an open discussion. And I, I since I, I uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Huang doesn't think we need a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, today is a, a trial. So if you have any question, you know, uh, 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 please raise your hand and ask question because there's no question too simple or uh, uh, naive or stupid because we assume nobody have a background. So please ask question. Yeah, that's our purpose. Yeah. Okay, so I see Brian has uh, his uh, electronic hand up. So please, uh, Brian. Yeah, Jason, thank you for your uh, comment because I have two stupid questions. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just say quickly what they are and then uh, let you run with it. But uh, the two things that struck me is, uh, the question is, how does one move or attain the divine mind? Is, is What I can imagine is some people are kind of born with it or uh, others are, educated to it i mean i can guess what it is in the confucian tradition but i just wanted that's a question that struck me the second thing is uh this whole idea that you mentioned at the very end justice the the uh the just retribution uh that's a very vague term so i and i know it's probably not fair to 
ask you to go off and discuss that, but that's a that's I, obviously I think is subject to a lot of different understandings. So I'll be paying attention to that. Okay, so I can guarantee you that your two questions are not stupid at all because I will need the next five minutes to answer the first question. So the first question is how can someone advance on the epistemological journey? Okay, of course, the answer is from the Confucian tradition since I'm speaking of this Confucian tradition today. Uh, the, there is, uh, once I, I want to remind first that in the Confucian tradition, you have uh, two groups uh, of uh, classics, okay? The first group is called the Wu Qing, the five classics. And the second group is called the Su Shu or the four books of the Confucian tradition. Uh, my answer is the following and please bear with me. It will be a quite long answer, but I don't, I don't know how to answer your question in a short manner. Imagine a square and a triangle above the square, okay? Like a, a simple design of a house, okay? Let's start with the square. The square for me symbolizes the four books, okay? And it's also the foundation. Why? Because the four books are dealing with epistemology. The, the four books are, maybe some of you know what they are, but I wouldn't remind you what they are. You have the Analex, the Lun Yu, you have the Mencius, you have uh, the Tashue, the Great Learning, and you have the Chong Yong, the, uh, the doctrine of the mean. How do you reach to the divine kingdom is to have, uh, to be associated with good person. If you are from a Chinese tradition to study the Chinese classic and first and foremost, uh, the foundation represented by the square, by the four books. And I want to have a certain development on the Tashui, the great learning, and the Chongyong. Let's start first with the Chongyong. The Chongyong said that the four tasks of the gentleman is first to cultivate himself. And once he cultivates himself, he will put order in his family. He will assist in the governance of the state and he will bring peace to the world. That's the Chongyong. The Tashui, the great learning, will expand on the Chongyong from the following three guidelines, okay? The first guidelines is to make your inner virtue bright. Those uh, uh, phrases can sound very strange and very abstract, but with time you will better understand them. So first guideline is to make your inner virtue bright. Second uh, principles or guideline is to make, to renew people. And once again, it will need a certain explanation. And three is to abide in the highest good. Okay, and let's not forget that those are principles. To renew people is that when you are in interaction with people, you, if you are a gentleman, you should be capable to uplift their epistemological level by being a role model because uh, to renew people is to make them not being victim of their past memories, that they can precisely be uplifted above that animal kingdom of vitality, intellect, and psyche, and to go to the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. And to abide in the highest good is the main mission of the gentleman, of course. The number one principle is the most strange, okay? To make your inner virtue bright. And that is here that I would like to go to the A stages that we can find in the Tashue, the great learning, okay? It's not for nothing, it's called the great learning. The great learning is not about uh, calligraphy, it's not about arithmetic, it's not about geometry. Uh, here, maybe Plato would disagree <laughs> because I think it would see geometry as a great learning. But anyway, but you know, you understand what I mean. The great learning is not learning a skill. Okay, the great learning is truly the epistemological uh, journey or adventure or endeavor. So that uh, uh, first principle of uh, making your inner virtue bright 
is explained in the pathway in four steps in the A stages, because in the A stages, the fifth stages is called cultivate yourself, okay? Okay, uh, six, seven, eight, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, the fifth stages is called cultivate yourself. And six, seven, eight is a repetition of the Chong Yong, okay? Put order in your family at six, uh, assist in the governance of the state at seven and bring peace in the, to the world at eight. But what is truly important and what's answer to your question, and I'm thank you to be patient enough to listen to me for five minutes before I go to the core of the answer. How do you, how do, you do to go to the timeless form or to the divine kingdom? It's precisely the, the, the first four stages of the Tashwe, meaning put order in your own affair first at first, okay? Meaning that, uh, let's not kid yourself or because if you don't put order in your family, if you are uh, not in your family, in, in yourself first, meaning if you are criminal, if you are a drug addict, if you are alcohol addict, uh, if you have problems with your, but serious problems with your family or you, you don't raise your kid, you abandon them and, and that kind of thing. Well, uh, it's useless to go further because you don't even answer to the basic human requirements. Okay, that's what is mean by the first step of the task way, put order in yourself. Once you put order in yourself within your, your average citizen, you will go to the second stage, which, which is ke wu chu chu. Okay, ke wu chu chu in Chinese, but I would translate by extend your knowledge by exploring reality. Okay, as comprehensively as possible. Okay, sometimes four Chinese characters need to maybe uh, 10 or 12 English words to translate that. Uh, meaning that, uh, and there you go to very deep down to earth stuff, okay? You associate with the good people, uh, with knowledgeable knowledgeable people, with gentlemen. Uh, you, you study for a skill, for a trade, but you also keep on your epistemological journey, etc. That is what is meant by ke wu chu chu. That is probably the big stuff in the, uh, maintaining or making your inner virtue bright. At the third stage, which is also a big stuff too, uh, is making your intention sincere, okay? Because uh, you can uh, explore reality, inner reality, outer reality. You can make friends with gentlemen. You can make friends with knowledgeable people. But is it really to make yourself advance on your epistemological journey? Or is it only for entertainment or even worse to, to take advantage of people in some groups, for example? So uh, that is making your intention sincere, okay? And in every interaction of your life, be it uh, professional or for amusement or for entertainment, etc. And the number four is to ba balance your mind. And to balance your mind is precisely that balance between heaven and earth, or if you want heaven being the lines four, five, six, the timeless forms of truth, beauty, goodness, and truth. And one, two, three, which are the uh, animal dimensions of vitality, intellect, and psyche, okay? Psyche is, is also sometimes translated as the heart mind. Or uh, if you want, the vitality is the senses perception domain, the intellect is the concepts, the words, and the images domain. And uh, the psyche or the heart mind is the emotional domain, okay? Uh, things that are very uh, animal, and animal is not a bad word for me, okay? Animal means simply a living being belonging to a certain species, okay? So a human animal is a living being uh, belonging to the human species. Uh, of course, I'm a little, a little bit biased <laughs> since I belong to that human species. Uh, the human animal probably has more uh, epistemol epistemological possibility than the cat animal or the dog animal or the horse animal. But I'm sure that if the dogs and the cats and the horse can talk, they would refute me uh, strongly. That being said, the, the notion of justice and I, I am grateful to you that it would be a kind of sideline uh, discussion because it would be another discussion for me, okay? But if you want, if you go through the stages of 
epistemological development as suggested by the first four phase stages of the Tasue, well, justice would be that you wouldn't be capable to treat as fairly as possible and as humanly as possible in the three big spheres of human interactions, which the Tasue invited you to do, meaning uh, put order in your family, the first big sphere within which we evolve. The second big sphere, which is the nation in which we are assist in the governance of the state. And the third one would be bring peace to the world. Uh, the third biggest sphere of the three general spheres of our human interactions. <clears throat> wow, thank you very much. I, I see Joe has a question. Yeah. How does this relate to Ren? Ren is goodness. Okay, so the three lines of the heavenly kingdom, four, five, six, four is a timeless form of so beauty. But in Chinese, we don't say beauty, we say yi, justice. Because beauty is, of course, physical beauty, is also the domain of the mathematical forms. But it's justice, it's courtesy, it's kindness, it's uh, architecture, it's literature, it's belle lettre, it's everything that has to do with beauty. Okay. And run, uh, hum humanness, true humanness, true humanity. I think that there are many translations, but since uh, we are in a Chinese country group, I wouldn't limit myself to run. Run is precisely the fifth line, it's, it's goodness. Okay. Okay, and the sixth line stuff is truth, and in Chinese is Dao. Okay, or Zheng, but Dao uh, is uh, my preferred translation for the sixth line. Well, the, my preferred Chinese character for this, the sixth line, which is the Chinese equivalent of truth. Thank you. So how about one, two, three? So you talk about four is run and the five is ah, e. Five, uh, five, forgive me, five is a run and four is e. Okay, four is e, so you trace it as a justice. I, I agree. And how about one, two, three? You, you, one, how, how one, you... one is uh, vitality. Vitality. It's the, vitality it's of chi. A, a chi, if you want, but at the basic level, okay? Because as you know very well, Jason, Chi can yeah. have different layers yeah. of the interpretation. The basic chi, materialized the, chi, yeah. Exact. Uh, we agree okay. absolutely. Uh, energy, if you want, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, two is the intellect. The intellect meaning uh, the capacity Jeez. to, yeah, chi. Well, maybe not because chi has a, a meaning of wisdom too. Is there a lower word than chi? Uh, um, so what's the Chinese word on the second the second one? Uh, it's you too, but I, I, I am a little bit hesitant you too on that because the intellect uh, I know. is it's low. A, it's true, it's true. Okay, it's, but it's, it's true by different understanding of the zi. By different understanding. Thank you okay. for that. Okay, and because, the, how, about, how about three? Three, the psyche is the- uh, Oh, xin, xin, xin. Xin, exactly. Exactly. Okay, got you. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so this one is based on one piece interpretation of the ten winds. Of the ten winds, and uh, let's not forget that the ten winds, according to tradition, has been revised by Confucius. Okay, you have yeah. two. Yeah. You you have two schools. One school would say that uh, it has been entirely written by Confucius. The second school, which I prefer said it has been revised by Confucius because the 10 winds is a very old text, okay? And it has many layers with time. So I prefer to say that it has been revised by Confucius. Thank you, yeah. What's 10 so, winds? Uh, 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 forgive me, I did not hear what you said. What, what's 10 winds? The 10 winds is a philosophical uh, interpretation that has been appended, added to the classic called the Yi Ching. Yi Ching is the classic of change, of course, uh, but uh, the 10 wings of Shu Yi in, uh, in, uh, in Chinese okay. is a 
philosophical and epistemological interpretation of how to use the books of the oh. I Ching. Okay, thank you. And uh, I see that Chris Gate uh, wrote that he considered uh, <laughs> Wang Pi a Taoist. I beg you to differ because uh, 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 Wang Pi had political ambitions. Uh, here we can discuss. And what is the major difference between a Taoist and a Confucian for me? is that the Confucian insists absolutely that the gentleman return to the society, to his family, to his society, into the world, to help uplifting people within his capacities, of course, and to participate to the society. Uh, I don't think that the, the difference between Taoists and Confucianists are in the in the philosophical interpretation, because I consider them as two wings of the same scholarly tradition. But the ultimate uh, uh, differentiating factor is that really you would be a total reject in the Confucian world, the universe, if you don't go back to the society to bring what you have learned and to share with the society. Okay. And according to that uh, interpretation or differentiating factor, Wang Pi was something who was very present into, into his own society uh, during his lifetime from 226 AD, BC, uh, CE, sorry, to 249 CE. Uh, he had a very short life, okay? So uh, he did not have much time to be present in uh, at court or at society. So no more questions? Should we can continue or? Yes, because uh, let's not forget that I have another big pieces to present uh, uh, related to the uh, Yen Tie Lun, the debate on salt and iron, because uh, and is related to the Kong Yang Zhuang interpretation of the Chun Chu. Okay, so no, I, I actually did have a question. I, 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 you're going to talk also about uh, uh, Dong Zhong Shu and uh, little... and and that that angle of uh, uh, the the spring and autumn. Yeah, uh, I would just talk a little bit about Tong Chong Shu, but you're absolutely right to mention him. I, I see that you know the, uh, the, the Kong Yang Chuang interpretation because uh, Tong Chong Shu was, uh, Tong Chong Shu, to pronounce correctly, was the major philosopher linked to the Kong Yang interpretation precisely. So question, how do you, re I, I don't see the relation between uh, Yan Tie Lun, the, how do you call it, the, 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 so, the, so, the debate, the, yeah, yes. yeah, the, 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 the famous debate uh, be, between the, uh, the uh, how, how, do, how do you call it, uh, franchise, okay, <laughs> French, franchise, uh, government franchise. Okay, so yes. how does this relate to Chun Chu? That, that's my question. <laughs> It relates to Chun Chu by the Kong Yang interpretation because the you you remember probably well I would use English words okay but in that debate happening in 81 BCE under the regency of Ho Kuang because Emperor Chao was a minor at the time the two factions who were debating were called the modernists and the conservatives okay. And the, uh, the modernists uh, were people mostly from the Kong Yang Chuang interpretation. Uh, I, I want to say that the crowd were called the modernists were a very mixed crowd, okay? You have rich merchant like uh, Hong Yang Sang, for example, uh, uh, Sang Hong Yang, I'm sorry. Uh, and you have a military man, but you, the intellectuals in that modernist faction 
were from the Kong uh, Yang Chong interpretation. Uh, Jason, Gong, I Gong, don't... Yeah. Gong Yang interpreter is more on the economical side. Or... Exactly. Yes, well, uh, it, the, say... the debate is between the concept of uh, so-called, one is legalism, belief, right? Talk about utilitarian. Another side is talking about the Confucianism side, okay? So uh, uh, that, that's my understanding. So I'd like to see how you relate it to this one. Exactly. I'm very grateful, uh, Jason, again, for your standpoint because I'm absolutely delighted to contradict you at each time. <laughs> That's because we, we truly have, uh, I would not say a direct opposition in, on our stand, but we have nuance in our understanding of stuff. And uh, I know that you know those stuff. Uh, okay, I want to make a historical reminder for everyone because uh, not everyone understand the historical context of the debate, okay? So the debate happened in 81 BCE. It was under the minor emperor Kong Chao, who was a son of the great emperor Wu Di. When emperor Wu Di died in 87 BCE, his son was four or five years old. Okay, so he needed a regent, a region, a prince region, and that prince region was a guy named Huo Kuang. Huo was his family name, H-U-O and Kuang, G-U-A-N-G, was his given name. So that great emperor Wu Di ruled between 141 BCE and 87 BCE. So he ruled for 54 years. I think that he was the, the, it was the second longest reign of uh, Chinese history. During that reign, uh, the Chinese empire expanded tremendously, okay? What is called Central Asia, what is called the Xinjiang province nowadays, came, became a Chinese protectorate. And under the guidance of Emperor Wu, a general called He Chu Bing and Wei Qing uh, conquered the Xiongnu that the Westerner calls the Huns in 119 BCE. And those Xiongnu's or Huns were truly uh, a permanent danger for the Chinese empire. So to, to say things in a short way, the Chinese empire at the time expanded tremendously, but the peasant at the time uh, suffered tremendously too because the army and the provisions and the money needed for the expansion of the empire and to bring down the Huns uh, or the Xiongnu of course, uh, were extracted from the peasants. So in 81 BCE, the debate was precisely on everything that I just said, and I want to say it again. The discourse on salt and iron took place behind a tumultuous background. The previous ruler, Emperor Wu of Han, has undertaken a drastic change in policy compared to his predecessors reversing their laissez-faire policy at home and policy of appeasement of the Xiongnu abroad, he nationalized coinage, salt, and iron in order to pay for his massive campaigns against the Xiongnu Confederacy, which posed a threat to the Chinese empire and a limitation to its expansion. Although Wu was successful in his campaign, his policy bankrupted many merchants and industrialists led to widespread uh, dissatisfaction and even revolts against imperial authority. After his death, the region Ho Kuang called a court conference to discuss whether to continue Wu's policies. So the policies in the early Han, meaning before Emperor Wu and um, he were marked by laissez-faire principles due to the adoption by the early emperors of the Taoist principle of Wu Wei, literally meaning do nothing. As part of the laissez-faire policy, agricultural taxes were reduced and agricultural to output to 130, 30th, and for a brief period, abolished entirely. In addition, the labor corvée 
required of peasant was reduced from one month every year to one month every three years, and the minting of coins was privatized. Wine chain taxes on song and other commodities were removed. So the debate was for the following stuff. As complaints surfaced, criticizing more and more about the government's policies, the region Ho Kuang, who was the facto ruler of China after Emperor Wu of Han Dai, called a court conference to debate whether the policies of Emperor Wu should be continued. And the resulting debate was divided into two groups, the reformists and the modernists. The reformists, largely provincial Confucian scholars, backed privatization and a return to the laissez-faire policies of old. The modernists, on the other hand, largely represented the interests of the central government and were more in tune with legalist philosophy, as Jason mentioned. But you have to understand that even if they were more in tune with legalist philosophy, many of them were partisan of the Kong Yuan interpretation for a broader understanding of Confucius, who was more than a teacher of rituals, but truly a philosopher king having proposed a epistemopolitical plan for the future because he himself uh, failed politically, okay? Let's not forget that I want to remind that he died in 479 BCE and his last political chance has been utterly destroyed in 484 BCE when King Chao of Chu died that year because King Chao of Chu offer him a possibility to bring some reform to the Chu kingdom. But unhappily, he died some months later and Confucius knew perfectly that it was the last change for him to bring practical political changes. So during the last five years, well, he always uh, took care of epistemological development, of course. But during those five years of life, he focused intensely on that epistemological dimension because he knows that he failed politically and what he called the Li Yue Chupang, meaning the country governed by ritual and music, meaning a civilized country, would have to be postponed for future generations. Hence, his uh, uh, editing of the spring and autumn of the Chun Chu and the first generation of disciple Zuxia, more precisely, created that Kong Yang interpretation who has been transmitted. And uh, that interpretation, interpretation has been very important under the Han dynasty. And the Han dynasty is a 400 years long dynasty. So it has, a, has been a very important, uh, how can I say it, uh, departure of the Confucius school as the control matrix for the Chinese empire. Let's not forget that that control matrix of Confucianism or Ru Jia has been chosen by that famous emperor Wu precisely in 136 BCE, okay? So the fact that the Kong Yang school interpretation has been uh, the interpretation for the Han dynasty has been very important because it was a broader understanding of reality, of reality and of the universe. And at, in, the, in a certain sense, it has motivated the emperors and the politicians of the time to be more going forward in the expansion of the Chinese empire. And precisely the uh, fiscal and uh, economical uh, changes brought by Emperor Wu are questioned precisely after his death in 87 BCE. And that debate on salt and iron is much more a debate than on salt and iron. It's the debate on the perception and the broadness of the imperial ideology and of the uh, epistemological endeavor for the, for the next centuries of the Chinese empire, even under different uh, dynasties. And now I would like to take the next five minutes to 
summarize, okay, the two position. I will start with the reformist position, which is the position, that's my own bias, okay? But I think that the what so-called reformist position is a narrower position, it's a smaller position, okay? So I would read what I, uh, what you, I think that it would be interesting for you to know. So the reformist view was based on the Confucian ideal which sought to bring about the betterment of man by conformity to fundamental moral principles. To achieve this, they wished to reduce controls, demands for service, and taxation to a minimum. The reformist criticism of the monopolies largely center on the idea that the state should not compete with the people for profit, <clears throat> as it would tend to oppress the citizenry while doing so. Mercantile venture were not proper activities for the state. They pointed out that the monopolies had placed an immense burden on the citizenry. In addition, the reformers complained that the state monopolies oppressed the people by producing low quality and impractical yes. iron tools that were useless and made only to meet quotas, yet with which the peasant had to pay for regardless of their quality. The reformers believe former private smelting by small scale family enterprises made better implements because of pride of workmanship and because they were closer to the users in contrast to the state monopoly. In addition, the reformers complained that the state monopolies could not coordinate the production in accordance to the needs of all the provinces of the empire with some areas overproducing and actually forcing the peasant to buy the surplus. The reformers also criticized the aggressive foreign policy of Emperor Wu, which they believe has weakened instead of strengthening China and whose costs did not justify the benefits involved. And now I would like to read the position of the modernist position. And once again, it is a very mixed crowd, but in the intellectual who are in that crowd were partisan of the Kong Yang interpretation of the Chun Chu. The modernists were headed by Sang Hong Yang, and precisely Sang Hong Yang was not an, an intellectual. He was a rich merchant who has been named by Emperor Wu to lead uh, the taxation reforms and the commercial reforms in order to get more money for the campaign against the Huns and for the expansion of the empire. So I, 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 I start again. The modernists were headed by Sang Hong Yang, an ex-merchant who has been selected by Emperor Wu to administer to his new interventionist policies. They justify the imposition of controls on the grounds that they would <clears throat> thus uh, arrest profits from wealthy private merchants that could pose a threat to the state and bring them into state coffers. Particularly, the modernists claim that salt and iron industrialists were brutal and tyrannical, who employ thousands of workers that could potentially become rebels. The modernists took the view that with its iron mon monopoly, the state could effectively distribute tools of good quality for the use of the peasant, as well as the stabilizing the price of many essential goods. They also claim that private workshops were too small, unspecialized, and poorly equipped. Modernists claim the government workshop offer better working conditions and access to more materials than private workshops. In addition, the modernists claims that the expansionist campaigns were necessary to defend China from barbarian incursions and that by nationalizing the salt and iron industry, the state could obtain the funds needed to defend the empire without imposing additional burdens on the peasantry. Okay, so if you follow the two positions, the reformists are what I would call small conservative Confucian from the provinces. That's my interpretation. And of course I'm biased. And the modernist position would be 
the Confucian scholar with the Kong Yang interpretation, meaning a more universal interpretation seen Confucius as a philosopher king and not only a teacher of rituals and uh, buttressing the fact that a powerful state is in harmony with the advancing epistemological development of its own citizen and not staying in a string state, if you want. But that's my own uh, expansionist view, if I may say so. So the legacy, the modernists survived this debate, so they won the debate. So the Kung Yang, Chuang, they won the debate in 81 BCE, survived this debate with most of their policies intact and only the monopoly on liquor <laughs> abolished, although Sang Hong Yang was executed later in 80 BCE, so the year after the debate for treason. Reformers gradually gained more power through the rest of the former Han due to the growing instability of the modernist policy. Because of course, if you have an expansionist mentality, you risk overstretching of the resources of the empire, of course. So they briefly succeeded in getting the central government monopolies on salt and iron abolished from 44 to 41 BCE, though this was unsuccessful. And the monopolies resumed till the end of Wang Mang. And Wang Mang uh, created a, a short dynasty between 9 and 23 CE, which imposed ultra modernist policies. After his overthrow, the government of later hand resumed earlier laissez-faire policies and relinquished control of these industry to private businessmen. So why I wanted to talk about that salt and iron debate is because I wanted to say that philosophical standpoint when adopted by rulers can have very practical consequences on everyday life. And it's not only a abstract uh, discussion between intellectual, okay? So uh, Emperor Gu, who was a very, uh, how can I say it, important sovereign for the Chinese history, uh, found that specific school of Kong Yang Chuang interpretation uh, absolutely fit for his own expansionist goals and his, uh, uh, imperial purposes, if I may say so. So uh, I want to pose another time if there is a question interactions. So uh, let, let me start, okay. I, I, I try to make sure because I'm not that familiar with uh, the salt and the iron debate. Uh, I, when I look at this, one, I totally look at on the political side. So I didn't look at on the uh, philosophical side. So I, I think, thank you very much for bringing this together. I, I never think of this one before. Uh, so I, I just want to make it clear, uh, correct me if I was wrong. So Huo Guang is on the reformer list, right? Because he, am I right? Huo Guang is the reformer list. Well, and the, okay. uh, uh, Huo Guang, okay. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm no, probably no, I, wrong. I, I, I want you to let you finish because I want to understand you completely before answering. Okay, so I just want to make sure, to correct me, but I probably don't know very clear. So Huo Guang is on the reform mist, right? And, and uh, uh, the Wu Di, the left, the Wu Di is on the modernist and who modernists support the uh, Gong Yang uh, interpretation of Sun Qiu. And uh, because they support the state uh, enterprise, uh, power, in today's words, the big government and the small government. So uh, the modernist is the big government and uh, the reformist is the small government. Small government. And, right. and then uh, the turnout, the big government won, okay? But Huo Guang still get the power. That's why he has the San Hong Yang got executed, okay? And, but the policy being, being continue as a, a, a big government, but who are going to get the power? I, I don't know. That's my understanding. Am I correct, or what? Or you have a different uh, view? If I may, if you give me the permission, Please, yeah. I would say that I would give you ninety-five percent <laughs> because uh, that, that's pretty good. I like to hear from you. Yeah. Yes. 
uh, I would say that you understood everything, maybe a, a small thing, okay? Ho Kuang uh, was a weak man, okay? That's why he has been chosen by Emperor Wu. Because let's not forget that Ho Kuang is, is in the same family that Ho Chu Bing, okay? And Emperor Wu loved very much Ho Chu Bing because Ho Chu Bing contributed a lot to the expansion of the empire. So Ho Kuang has been chosen because he was a weak man and oh. uh, he, he listened to the powerful people in court at the time. And uh, uh, Emperor Wu knew perfectly that the faction of the modernists or the faction who were in favor of Emperor Wu were the most powerful official at the time. And he knew perfectly that He Kuang would simply go with the crown. However, in 81 BCE, he was forced to, uh, to have that debate because it was becoming more and more difficult for the peasant. Because uh, as you know, uh, Jason, uh, the expansion of the empire under Emperor Wu has, uh, has brought a lot of suffering to the Chinese people, even if the Chinese empire grew incredibly, I would say by 35%, okay? But of course it, it has a price and the debate of 81 BCE was to try to to see to what extent uh, they can bring some nuance or some small uh, reforms into those uh, imperial policies in order to reduce a little bit the suffering of the peasant of, and of the Chinese people at the time. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I think that, that that's good. At least that's great. And I'm sorry for some people probably lack of background. And I hope that Juan and I's discussion discussion is not too technical for most of the people. So I, I will encourage more question uh, on the uh, different level, you know, or different angle. Yeah, please. Yeah. And uh, I I like very much that you are small and big governments uh, analogies. It's perfectly that. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think Joe, Joe, Joe has a question. Okay, okay yeah, Joe has a question. I'm trying to figure out, like, how does this actually, <laughs> does this impact modern day China at all? Uh, well, oh, la, la. That's, that's a bit, very big question. If you're ready to listen to some of my, uh, of my uh, divagations, I'm willing to give you a small answer if you want. Uh, my Remember, own... that's 2,000 years ago, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's been very, it seems yeah. very, um, I don't know, it uh, seems like there's an expansionist policy, and I mean, it just seems, I don't know, interesting. I, I, I would say, okay, and that's my personal hypothesis, I always said that China has always been a legalist government uh, refined by Confucian principles, in the sense that Epistemologically, the citizens are encouraged to develop the epistemological level, to go above the vitality, the, the intellect and the psyche to the timeless form of beauty, truth and uh, goodness and truth. That's for sure, okay? What is central to Confucianism is Ran, which is the, the fifth line, goodness. However, uh, let's not be too naive. China has always been a state uh, within a legalist framework, okay? okay. Meaning if you have uh, rewards and you have punishment and the rewards and the punishment are very clear in case you don't respect the law, okay? Uh, you know, the Chinese state uh, is a, it's a serious one, okay? Uh, uh, I would say that in all the history of China, even if they use different labels, the Chinese state has always been a big state in that sense, even that even if intellectually and philosophically, the Kong Yang Chuang interpretation fall from favor after the 400 years long Han Dynasty and would come back only at the Ming Dynasty, meaning between 1368 uh, to 1644, uh, the, how can I say it, the foundational proclivity, the foundational mentality of the Chinese state has always been what I call the Kong Yang Chuang, interpretation Chinese state, or to use the excellent metaphor used by Jason, 
The Chinese state has always been a big state most of the time in Chinese history. Thank you. And Brian has a question. Yeah, I'm really, I was struck by the tie-in. I thought it was fascinating between the epistemological development, uh, which I would call, let's just call education, and the uh, expansionist policies, uh, economic policies, uh, the difference between big and small government. The, uh, the first thing that struck me, it was just fascinating to hear what you said, is um, that I, I recognize a pattern in what you uh, described, uh, which has also occurred at other times and other places in history, and that is expansionist policies lead to centralization. Um, and then, uh, for, uh, unfortunately, for the, with an increase of burdens on the local people, and that this can then become very unstable. And the um, it it can sometimes I think be be even worse than instability if the government looking for expansion is defeated. Uh, then the the, uh, the instability is crushing. So the instability comes not from domestic internal but from external sources. The ones that struck my mind are the and then I have, I have three here, but I think there's many more. The um, the one that you know everyone talks most, everyone always points to the Nazi regime. That was one that was um, clearly expansionist uh, and did impose burdens on uh, the local people, and then they were defeated, and that was a crushing, uh, a crushing burden on the on the uh, German people and anybody living in Germany or under the Nazi control. The um, the other one that I've run across recently in my studies is the uh, early Iron Age uh, Kingdom of Judah in the Middle East. And that obviously receives a lot of attention because that's part of the biblical history. But there between the fall of the what they call the Northern Kingdom uh, to the Assyrians and then the conquest of the Kingdom of Judah by Babylon, there was an expansionist policy, or there, let's put it this way, there were expansionist kings pursuing an expansionist policy in um, the Kingdom of Judah. More precisely, they wanted to expand into the Northern Kingdom that had been taken over by Assyria. And to do that, they really pushed for centralization. Um, and that also did not work out, but led to a lot of uh, oppression and burdens on, on the people of Judah. The, um, but the one that really intrigued me because of the tie-in with the epistemological development uh, is the French experience. So it little presents, I think it presents itself a little differently uh, in that there was an expansionist policy under Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, there had already been significant centralization before that. But then he continued the centralization, imposed greater burdens on the people for the purpose of his expansionist policies, and uh, after those, uh, those after his victories had faded away. The French government was let was left with heavy debts, which Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth had to deal with, and there was this very very centralized government with a heavy debt based on uh, expansionist policies. But they also, and this was the interesting thing, as I understand it, they they believed they the. The royalty, together with the church, believed that the education of people depended on the state, the state and the church, the establishment. And then 
the Enlightenment uh, philosophers came along and said, no, the, you know, reaching that, if you will, achieving the divine mind, being educated is muddled by the intervention of the state, the government and the church. And it's the natural impulses of individuals which uh, can lead to the divine mind, contemplation and uh, of the, uh, if you will, the, the animal characteristics that you referred to. So uh, I find, and then even these words like laissez-faire that you've used to capture what's going on, these concepts are French and some of the French obtained their, their understanding of these issues through reading uh, Chinese philosophy. So that I think is really, really interesting to me. Um, I don't know if you have more comment on that, but it's just this tie in between epistemological development, in other words, education or educational policy, the understanding of what works to educate people and uh, government centralization, I think is really, really interesting. Yeah, thank you for your, uh, your command, Brian, because I think you, you got the core essential of the link between epistemological development as encouraged by the government, because let's not forget the link, okay? If a government wants to be expansionist, he, that government will need a competent and capable people for that expansion. So the education is to create uh, uh, officers and uh, people capable having leadership skills uh, to, to lead that expansion precisely. And there is a dialectic, I would say there is a timeless dialectical between what I would call epistemological uh, development of your education uh, between uh, that kind of education, but uh, driven by public policies and uh, education uh, driven more by personal or private interests. And there was always a kind of interaction, if not clash between those two positions. The other thing that excited me a lot in your speech is about uh, the presence of Chinese classic in the 18th century Europe, okay? Because you know that the two European uh, scientists and intellectual who were prominent uh, to promote Chinese uh, culture or at least certain Chinese classics were Leibniz and Von Peer. And, uh, and you probably know that, for example, that the British uh, civil examination and the French civil examination uh, were created inspired by the Chinese model. No, I did not know that. That's uh, and thank you for that tie. And I've I'd heard that the Europeans had been inspired by the Chinese, but I I wasn't aware of the tie-ins. Thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, and Von Ter has been a major influencer uh, for that kind of meritocratic exams. Who, which kept on, of course, with Napoleon the First, Napoleon Bonaparte who essentially created the modern framework of the French state. Yes, that's also, I think, a very important point. I, my earlier thoughts had stopped with the revolution, but when you, you adding on Napoleon really completes the picture. Yeah, Napoleon is the father of the modern French state. Uh, uh, if you have finished, Brian, I would go to Jason. Yes. Yeah, I kind of like the touch on uh, Joe's question. Okay, uh, the influence. Yeah, I I I very amazed on the uh, the salt and the iron debate. I think this one to me the it shows how open in the ancient China even it's a centralized government because that's a very important uh, government policy and it's open to the debate, even not open to the general public debate, but it's invite different kind of opinion, uh, uh, people opinion to debate. And 
back to Joe's question, how does that influence China today? I think it's no influence, that's my answer, because uh, today's China probably go backward. They have less debate if you compare to during 2000 years ago, they're probably more open than today. So that's my opinion if I have to answer this question. And I think the changing point is the Mongolian invasion. And after that time, and uh, unfortunately, when the people who kick out the Mongolian is not a good people, basically they are, they 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 have a very narrow uh, nationalism thinking. So they just kick out Mongolian and they borrow the Mongolian, the Tyranian rule. So China start to go to the wrong direction. That, that's my personal opinion. So from time to time, I read ancient, like this one, iron uh, and the sword debate. I will admire how open, you know, during that time and how close even today. So that's my opinion. And another thing I'd like to comment on Quan's uh, 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 talk about legalism. It's a serious legalism. It's very correct because uh, reward and the punishment. And I'd like to mention the word reward. My opinion, Chinese law and Chinese government compared to Western government and Western law, Western law, Western government is a negative law, negative government. If you look at our law, our government, basics, we work on the punishment side, this on the reward side, okay. Uh, does that mean it's better or worse? In my opinion, it's better because government should be negative, law should be negative, and the positive should be dependent on individual. That's just my opinion. But if you want to compare, uh, 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 Western, our Western society, the government and the law, they on the reward side. And to me, the question is, do you want reward? Okay, my answer could be no, but some people may say yes. Uh, I have maybe about 10 minutes of speech, uh, but I want to ask if there are all the questions before I finish with that last 10 minutes of speech. Okay, one, no question, two, no question, three, no question. Okay, so let's go for my 10 minutes of speech, uh, closing my presentation today. Uh, I said, uh, if you remember, that I used the image of a square, okay, uh, speaking of the four books, okay, because once again, uh, we said in the Chinese tradition that we have the Wu Jing, the five classics, and the Su Shu, the four books. So the square being the foundation, meaning a treating of epistemology of uh, uh, the journey of the mind development are formed by the Analects, the uh, Mencius, a philosopher born in 372 BCE and died in 289 BCE, compared to Confucius who was born in 551 BCE and who died in 479 BCE, okay? And the Tashre, the great learning that I talk a little bit about the three principles and the A stages and the Chongyong, the doctrine of the mean. The Chongyong has been written by Confucius' grandson, Zhu Su, Z-I-S-I, and Zhu Su was born in 482 BCE, and he died in 401 BCE. And the famous Tashre has been written by Zheng Zhu, Master Zheng, Zheng, Z-E-N-G, a direct disciple of Confucius, born in 505 BCE and he died in 435 BCE. When I said that the Kongyang Chuang interpretation of the Chun Chu has been created by Zhu Xia, born in 4, 507 BCE and died in 400 BCE, Zhu Xia and uh, Zheng Zhu were among the youngest disciples of Confucius, okay? Because let's not forget that Confucius died in 479 BCE and Zhu Xia was born in 507. So when Confucius died, he was a young man of 28. And uh, Zheng Zhu uh, being born in uh, 505, when Confucius died in 495 BCE, he was a young man of 26. 
So those two young men will be extremely important in the future development compared to Confucius of the Rujia school, of the school of the scholars. And why, I, I think I said that, but I want to repeat that. The square is the foundation of the Chinese uh, uh, people de development, okay? It's the epistemology, is how to uplift yourself from the animal mind to the divine mind. And just above the square, uh, the square, I want you to imagine a triangle, okay? And uh, in that triangle, I want to speak about the Wu Qing, the five classic, and the, the two group, the Wu Qing, the five classic, and the Su Shu, the four books, are intimately related. Because at the center of the triangle, I put the Yi Qing, okay? with the six lines of the hexagram uh, symbolizing the epistemological development. And once again, I repeat, in a, in a fair society, the epistemological stature should ideally match perfectly with the social status, which is not what we have for now. Of course, I'm speaking of an ideal situation. And on the three corners of the triangles, I would put on the left, the rituals, and on the right, the book of poetry, okay? The, because let's not forget that the rituals, you have three books, even if they are counted as one book, okay? In the rituals, you have the Chou Li, the ritual from the Chou dynasty, the Li Yi, the, the, the ceremonies, and the Li Qi, which is the records on rituals. And on the right side of the, the, the triangle, I would represent the book on poetry. And on the top corner of the triangle, I would put the two historical and philosophical books, the Shang Shu or the Shu Qing, the book of documents, and above it, the Chun Chu, okay? The spring and autumn with the three interpretation of Ku Liang, Zuo Chuan, and Kong Yang Chuan, and I just, talk a little bit about Ku Liang and Zhu Chuang. And my main subject today was the Kong Yang Chuang interpretation. So why I want to, uh, to suggest you that image, just to say to you that the epistemological dimension is very, very, very intimately related to the triangle, which is the cultural legacy of the Chou dynasty. And that controlled legacy of the Zhou dynasty having rule, uh, really ruled between 1046 BCE and 770 BCE, and between 700, uh, 770 BCE to 256 BCE, they were still there, but they were not truly king because their former kingdoms has been divided into numerous principalities. And uh, but they were important because they were political arbiters and they were control models for the five centuries of political division before the reunification by Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China in 221 BCE. So you don't have to use my image, but that's, I think, the easiest way to understand the deep interrelation between the epistemological part of Chinese culture, the four books, and the cultural legacy of the Chou dynasty, the triangle just above the square. So it's the end of my presentation today, and I hope that it would help you to understand more about the classical China. I think there's some more questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, any questions on uh, this one? I oh, oh, probably I should stop the uh, recording and then uh, let me stop.